evening. Uh, thank you very much for coming this evening, and uh, despite the weather. Uh, this is our first time back at the IA actually since about 2019, so before COVID. So we weren't sure how many people would uh, come out this evening because we know people have got out of the habit, I think, of going to these type of events. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, now, I'm Simon Clark and I'm Director of Forest, and tonight's discussion is about the potential prohibition of tobacco, uh, or at least making smoking uh, obsolete. And what may lie beyond that, because it's pretty clear uh, that the public health industry won't stop with smoking. They'll move on to other things like vaping, and we're already seeing them move into areas such as uh, uh, eating and drinking. Um, now, I'm going to introduce our speakers in a moment, but before I do that, I want to briefly explain uh, the purpose of tonight and why we're uh, discussing this topic. Now, in relation to tobacco, uh, the threat of prohibition is nothing new. We've seen creeping prohibition for at least the last uh, 15 years or more. Uh, the smoking ban, of course, banned smoking in all public places, many of which were essentially private businesses like uh, pubs and restaurants. Um, since then, we've had uh, the display ban, we've had plain packaging, we've had a ban on mental cigarettes, which was, not many people commented it, uh, on it at the time, but at the time, mental cigarettes um, represented 20% of the cigarette market in the UK. So when they were banned, that made a, a huge, uh, so that was a huge blow to you know, millions of, of smokers who liked mental cigarettes and overnight had them uh, taken away. And of course, with uh, public smoking bans, we're now seeing that they're being extended into outdoor areas. Uh, when the indoor smoking ban came in, we were told it was all about protecting the health of bar workers. Well, I don't know how many bar workers are out on these sort of beaches and parks, but they're now trying to ban smoking in, in outdoor areas uh, as well. Um, and there's even talk about banning smoking in social housing, so actually in people's own homes. But perhaps the best example of creeping prohibition is actually happening not in the UK, but in New Zealand, where they are about to bring in a, well, they've already brought in a law, they haven't imposed it yet, um, but basically it's going to ban the sale of tobacco to uh, anyone born after 2008. Now, likewise in the UK, we've had a so-called independent report, the Khan Review, which came out last year, and that's recommended that the age of sale of uh, tobacco be raised by one year every year until no one is allowed to legally smoke anymore. And uh, in the meantime, of course, other people want to, uh, to raise the age of sale from 18 to 21. And of course, it's only um, 2008, I think it was, or 2007, when the uh, legal age of sale was raised from uh, 16 to 18. So 15 years later, they're trying to bump it up to 21, which is, in our view, is going to infantilise um, all those people between 18, 19, 20, who are legally adults, but will no longer be able to choose to uh, buy tobacco. At the same time, of course, many of the politicians who are, are calling for for a the age of sale to be raised to 21 are also uh, wanting the voting age reduced to 16. So uh, I think that's something else we might want to cover uh, this evening. Um, but it's not just the uh, politicians and public health campaigners who are targeting cigarettes. Uh, even the global tobacco giant Philip Morris has urged the UK government uh, to ban the sale of cigarettes in England by 2030. And last year in Scotland, uh, the UK's leading vape retailer, VPZ, launched a campaign urging the Scottish government uh, to ban smoking for good. Um, although I'm pleased to say that the petition um, that that campaign uh, set up on the Scottish Parliament website only got uh, 103 people to, to actually sign it. <laughs> uh, so that campaign seems to have crashed and burned a bit. Um, but even vaping products aren't safe because there are currently demands to prohibit uh, flavoured e-liquids and disposable vapes, uh, which would, of course, deny adults legal access to a product that's helped many smokers quit um, a potentially more harmful habit. Now, to discuss these and other issues, I'm going to introduce our panel. Um, I'm going to start from my left and then move down. So we'll start with uh, Christopher Snowden. Chris is uh, Head of uh, Lifestyle Economics at the IEA here. 
He is the editor of the Nanny State Index, and he's a regular contributor to The Spectator, uh, Telegraph, Spite, CapEx, and many more titles. Uh, he's the author of Killjoys, Selfishness, Greed, and Capitalism, The Art of Suppression, uh, and Velvet Glove, Iron Fist, which was uh, a book he wrote back in about 2008, 2009, and is the best book I've ever read on the history of smoking, and it's still perfectly relevant uh, today. <laughs> ah, but more important, ladies and gentlemen, most important, he was recently elected Vice President of oh. Shoreham Snooker Club. Yay. 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 Round of applause. Oh yes, we'll get round to that later. Um, now, Reem uh, Abraham is a final year student at the London School of Economics, where she is studying, or studying uh, is a loose uh, term, <laughs> um, she claims to be studying politics and history. Uh, she was recently appointed communications officer here at the IEA. She's a regular political commentator on GB News and Talk TV. In fact, She's never bloody well off uh, GB News and Talk TV. <laughs> and uh, she recently appeared on uh, BBC's Politics Live. Was that your first time on that? It was my first time Politics Live, yes. Fantastic. Oh, and she's also vice president of the LSE <coughs> Hayek Society. Um, hey. 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 That was that was Let's hope nobody <laughs> uses the word sound. Uh, oh, it's a horrible. Sound. Word. sound. <laughs> <laughs> Right, moving on. Henry Hill. Henry is deputy editor of Conservative Firm. Hooray! Um, before that, he was... Oh, he, he's a meteoric uh, cl um, climb. Because before that, he was assistant editor. And before that, he was news editor. He's written for The Daily Telegraph, The Spectator, Unheard, CapEx, and The Critic. Uh, he's also a frequent commentator on radio and television. And yesterday, and I'm not making this up, yesterday I received an email from a mutual acquaintance who described you, Henry, as a genius. <laughs> so, I'll tell you who it was later. Did you it? But it, I don't know who it was. I, 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 was equally, <laughs> I was equally surprised, but we'll find out later. Um, and last but not least, uh, we've got Cara Kennedy. Save the best for last. Well, absolutely. Now, um, Cara's had uh, already quite a, a boozy lunch. And... Uh, <laughs> She's a staff writer at the Spectator World, which is the US edition of the Spectator. Uh, she studied broadcast journalism at Cardiff University and was a trainee journalist at the Herald in Glasgow. Uh, she was a digital royal reporter at the Express, which might explain all your digs at Harry and Meghan uh, that don't go unnoticed. Um, and uh, you're completely right, by the way. You know, um, and uh, she's also written for The Telegraph. Uh, specifically, the reason she's here tonight is for one article in uh, particular uh, called An Ode to Smoking, which, which she wrote for The Spectator World. And uh, I urge you all to, to rush off and read it, but not, not just at this minute. Um, right. Now, very quickly, to establish their credentials, because you might wonder why they're actually, apart from Tara, who's written a note to smoking, you might wonder why these other uh, people are actually sitting here. What is their, you know, what was what their talent? What, what is, why are they here? So I'm going to ask each of them to say in turn, uh, to describe in a few words, their smoking history. So we'll start with uh, the oldest mem member of the panel. Uh, that's the man with the pipe. Um, uh, Chris, when did you start smoking, uh, and why, uh, and why and how did you quit? Well, Simon, the question of when do you start smoking is itself not that simple, is it? Because uh, anti-smoking people like you believe that the first time you had a cigarette is when you started smoking, when you became addicted. That wasn't the case for me or most people, I think. I think I probably pinched a cigarette from my grandmother's pack when I was about 11 or something, but I never actually started smoking until I was about 17. And then I smoked fairly continuously after that until about 12 years, 11, 12 years ago, when I switched to vaping. And apart from special occasions, such as no smoking day, I not smoked <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I am 20 years old, so my, my smoking history is sort of uh, quite short-lived. I started, I know, sorry, maybe Quitter. I shouldn't be here. Um, yeah, I started that. smoking when I was about like 14, 15, sort of similar thing, right? You start, you know, your first cigarette isn't necessarily when you start smoking. I probably had my first cigarette when I was like 14 or 15, um, and then started smoking properly when I was about 16 or 17. And I quit when I was 19 using a mixture of vaping and also the these wonderful nicotine pouches, which I will talk more about later. <laughs> okay. Henry. 
So I, I started smoking under the Snowdonian definition um, in 2014 <laughs> because I, I kept cadging cigarettes off people when I was out clubbing and it dawned on me that people who cadge cigarettes off were people without ever owning their own are deeply irritating people. <laughs> so I thought I should own my own and then having them to hand, um, I, I picked up the habit. And then I haven't quit. I, I once quit vaping because I, va I don't like vaping very much, uh, but alas. I haven't quit, but unfortunately I haven't smoked in months because all of the cigarettes that I like to smoke went with the plain packaging and flavour bans in 2016. And I'm now basically dependent on smugglers or people going through the airport. So if anyone, if anyone has a line on a dial, I'm not kidding, come and find me afterwards, please. Me? I'm trying to think. I think first cigarette behind the back of a bike shirt in school buying off the best entrepreneurs of Pontypridd selling um, 50 feet of fag. <laughs> the, the best times. I mean, I wonder where those people are right now. They, 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 they really knew how to make money. Um, yeah, smoked ever since. Love it, would never quit. Uh, but the piece that you mentioned, An Ode to Smoking, was written because one year I decided that um, I didn't want to give anything up for um, the new year. I wanted to start doing things that I liked more. So I smoked a lot <laughs> every day for a year. And it was the best year of my life. <laughs> well, funny enough, uh, we're going to start actually with that article because I did want to, uh, maybe I should have got you to read this out, but I'm just going to quote uh, just a short passage. Oh, just no. to give you a what flavor. What one is it? Um, no, no, it's, it's, not, it's nothing, uh, not, it's not one of the worst bits. Um, <laughs> it says, um, I don't think it's a coincidence that the last year has been the most fulfilling of my life. My closest friendships have been strengthened uh, through hours of conversation in smoking areas. My favorite nights have been in a dusty members club in Soho that lets you smoke when the curtains are closed. I'm not telling you what it is. And the most interesting conversations I've had have been sparked by someone asking, can I borrow your lighter? So, um, I mean, you've explained in a way why you wrote the article, but were you surprised by the response? Because there was a pretty overwhelming response, and most oh, of it fantastic. was positive. It's like, it Maybe the anti-lobby smoking doesn't read the spectator, but it was, no, it, was, it was an actually amazing response. I had so many messages and emails from people saying, this is exactly how I feel about smoking. I had one message from a guy, <laughs> this is hilarious, that was telling me that he fell in love with his wife, when she used to spark up a cigarette on the street and he ended up marrying her because of how cool she looked. And he even said to me, um, I kind of stopped the conversation after that, he was like, I kind of wish she would start smoking again. We've been married for 30 years, so I kind of wish she would start smoking again. Um, and I just think that's great. And everybody that I know had, in, in the piece you, you can read, but everybody that I know had just fantastic stories about smoking. Um, my boyfriend's sister uh, once uh, made a rollie for Prince Harry in a smoking area. I mean, the, the, the connections are, are unparalleled, the, the ones that you can make in a smoking area. I know people that have had jobs from meeting somebody in a smoking area as a, as a journalist that started in a time like just after lockdown when a lot of people weren't back in the office. There was a kind of massive age gap between me and a lot of journalists. I was the youngest person in the office to smoke. I would go out with the kind of hacks that had been in the Telegraph offices for 50 years and, and we would form relationships and form bonds from, from that five minutes over a cigarette. And I just think that, yeah, I think it's unparalleled. The, 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 the thing with smoking is whenever you go into a smoking area, you know, oh, these are these are the people that I want to be with. These are my people, you know? <laughs> so yeah, and I think it's, yeah, I think that's, that's how everybody feels. Okay, great. Deep down. <laughs> um, well, I also wanted to ask you about uh, Claire Fox, Baroness Fox has been in the news a lot this week uh, because she was disinvited from a uh, university debating society event. Um, now she's been a friend of Forrest for over 20 years and uh, Claire's talked of reaching for my fags in defiance uh, when people tell her to stop smoking. So I was going to ask, can you relate to that? Oh, and do you think other smokers, including smokers of your age, feel the same? Of course, I mean, uh, anything you tell me not to do, I will do. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's just how my personality works. Maybe it's not how everybody's does. But yeah, I mean, the, the fact that, uh, I, and this isn't just about smoking, this is about autonomy and, and kind of, being a grown-up and being able to do what you want to do in life, you know? Like, the second that somebody tells you not to do something, 
your natural thing is to do it. So yeah, I, I totally agree. It's yeah, and when people you go into to an area to light a cigarette and people start coughing and whatever, like come on, <laughs> come on, for it. yeah, come on, yeah. Okay. Now we're going to come back to another article Kyra's written, which is rather darker, but we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, in the meantime, I want to come back to talking about the Khan Review. Now, the Khan Review was commissioned uh, last year, last February, uh, by Sajid Javid when he was Health Secretary, and the report came out, I think it was June, wasn't it, uh, last year. Uh, now, we'll start with Chris, because um, basically it came up with about 14 different recommendations and uh, you've referred to, you've described most of them as being crackpot. Um, so would you like to explain to our audience here, you know, one of the most crackpot ideas he came up with? Uh, yes, um, the idea of painting cigarettes green or brown <laughs> in order to deter people from <laughs> buying them. I mean, for a brown cigarette is just a mini cigar. For <laughs> that's, it looks cool. Why, well, yeah, that's, yeah. that's not an unattractive <laughs> colour for a tobacco product. Um, he wants to, I think, pixelate out people smoking on TV after nine o'clock, even in, you know, documentaries about the Second World War or something like that. Uh, he wants to uh, increase the tax on cigarettes by enormous quantity, so it's £20 a, uh, twenty pound a pack. I mean, to be fair, Rishi Sunak has gone pretty close to that in the last, uh, last few weeks. I think cigarettes went up by about one pound seventy or something. Mm -hmm. Twelve percent, literally overnight. Mm -hmm. Hand rolling tobacco went up by inflation plus six percent. Inflation is, depending how you measure it, at least ten percent. Yeah, huge increases. Mm. Um, I have uh, I forgot the rest of them. So well, we'll, oh, we'll, 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 we'll come, come back to the main one. one. Well, obviously, the main one is the rate. Oh, the, the rate of the age thing, yeah. We'll come back to that in a minute. Reem, uh, I mean, what are your thoughts about the car review? Well, the last recommendation about promoting vaping, I think, is probably the only saving grace in the Khan Review um, at all. I mean, this idea that we should be, um, you know, trying to reach a, a smoke-free England by 2030 in the first instance, I think, is a is a sort of incorrect premise. And it comes as a result of this sort of paternalism that we see uh, government time and time again trying to implement. And it is about this sort of public good, this sort of the government knows better for you. And so the government will try, try and sort of implement these policies in order to change your own behaviour. Um, but yeah, the, the vaping part is probably the only good saving grace part okay. of the kind of We're going to come back to the to vaping and talk about that in a, in a whole section. Um, Henry, I mean, another proposal um, is for the government to impose a so-called tobacco levy on the tobacco companies, um, which would pay for more smoking cessation services and more anti-smoking campaigns. Now, we know that that levy will be passed on to the consumer, so it's going to push up the price of cigarettes even more. I mean, do we actually need more smoking cessation services and anti-smoking campaigns? I mean, I don't think so, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm, I'm an unrepentant smoker. Um, and, I, and I'm actually actively, actively pro-smoking because it's a, it's a fact of living in a democratic society that if you want your habits and, 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 and uh, preferences to be left alone, you do need a certain critical mass of people to share them. You know, it's once smokers started falling to a dangerously low share of the population that all of this nonsense really started gathering steam. So we need, in fact, fewer. <laughs> Um, and ideally we'd allow advertising and, and all of that good stuff so that we could try and get smokers back up to a sustainable share of the population. Now, now we're talking. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that went to an area I wasn't expecting. Um, but OK, let's move on to raising the legal age of sale uh, to 21, uh, because actually what um, uh, the Khan Review suggested was that the legal age of sale should be raised by one year every year until no one can smoke. Now, that's highly unlikely to be adopted by the government, but they are much more likely to adopt raising the age of sale to 21. Um, so, what, I mean, what does that say about how uh, the government views people who are aged 18, 19 or, or 20? Are they meant to be legally adult at the age of uh, 18? I mean, Reem, what do you think about it? Well, I mean, it's obviously ridiculous, right? I, I am 20, so under these, uh, if, if, if the age of sale is increased 21, I won't be able to legally buy tobacco at all until, until I turn 21, which I think is absurd, and it is the government treating uh, young adults as though they are children. I mean, from the age of 16, 
16 you're able to get married with parental permission from 16 you're able to join the army from 18 you can vote the fact that you can't then choose to light up a cigarette from the age of 21 i think is just completely absurd and it's it's the government sort of again telling people and telling people my age that we aren't capable of making decisions ourselves and the other extraordinary thing about it is that i mean you've all explained how what age you started smoking so when the age um, uh, age of sale was 18. That clearly had no effect on you guys whatsoever. So raising the age to 21 is going to have even less impact, I would have thought. I mean, Henry, what do you think? Well, tragically, uh, I was actually still able to buy them at 16 when I was 16. Uh, <laughs> not, to give it. Lucky not, man. Not, 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 not I mean, it, uh, I mean this, uh, conceptually, the whole thing is mad, right? I think it represents a really interesting shift in our values, and that previously, you know, generation two generations ago, uh, you were allowed to vote, join the army, marry, and so on at 16, and then you got the franchise at 18. Because it was seen that, you know, you had this sort of trial period of adulthood where you were given the chance to grow into a citizen and then you were given the vote. And now we've kind of completely flipped that on its head because many of the same people who want to raise the smoking age to 21 and everything else, they're like, we'll give them the vote at 16. And I think it's a, it says an interesting thing about sort of how seriously they actually think each of those two things are. But uh, again, speaking selfishly as somebody who's hugely pro-smoking, um, I think that creating a huge new market for the black market tobacco would be really potentially very useful because once you go into black market tobacco you never go back it's tax-free <laughs> um, you don't you get non-patronizing packaging you can get you can get menthols like it's an amazing basically whenever somebody goes oh, we're going to ban cigarettes i look at how easy it is to get hold of everything else they've actually banned <laughs> and i just sort of think well all right then I, you'll do it and so once if you can get young people early into the habit of you know learning how to use the dark web <laughs> that's going to be hugely positive for overall smoking right i mean it's going to be bad for like society and, and, and the government but in terms of smokers for them as smokers they're much better off learning how to do that when they're young and if they can't get it in shop till 21 that's when their brain elasticity is, is tight let's do it yeah, so you were worried about yeah. not having an anti-prohibition panelist. I know, but I'm, I'm more concerned about the guy who said that Henry's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, <laughs> I think he, I think he is. The, the whole thing is incredibly patronising. I mean, at 16, I lived on my own. I started working at 15 as a waitress. I... I was going to swear. <laughs> I won't say. I paid taxes. I contributed to the system, but I couldn't make a choice about my own body. I mean, it, it's, it's preposterous. I mean, if you can, if if you can earn money, if you can pay into the system, then you should be able to make the choice about your own life. But we have a problem, I think, and I'm looking at this from a campaigning point of view because my impression is that when we we, we, you know, if, if there is talk about uh, raising the age of sales to 21, we're going to go all guns blazing and try and campaign against it. But I don't sense that there's that many younger people who will join us in that campaign because, of course, smoking is fairly unfashionable. That's the reality or, within that age group hmm. these days. A lot more people. I disagree. Are, are they, I can't disagree. Oh, well, to say that. Arg now argue that. Great. Okay, <laughs> disagree. I, no, disagree. I think a lot. I mean, like the majority of my friends that you are actually when I was at well, I asked at Salam at university. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I forget that. Um, we had a, we had a cigarette smoking society WhatsApp chat where we'd all meet up on on LSE campus and sort of say, okay, like, who who wants to join us? For a cigarette and I made some of my bestest friends through that group chat so I actually think it's entirely untrue I think it's just worrying that all the smokers can fit in one group chat <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what's, the, what's the maximum of a whatsapp chat like 140 something like that okay well true I, I, think, uh, I think the reality is that firstly smokers as a whole are not very good as you know more than anyone in the country not very good at standing up for their own rights if you then salami slice that down to 18, 19, 20 year old smokers. It's a tiny minority within a minority. They know the anti-smoking people. They're not going to be able to put any kind of meaningful pressure on the government to stop this. This is how these bastards do it again and again. They salami slice it. They pick on minorities, menthol smokers, for example, you've already mentioned. Oh, we'll just take away their menthol. Uh, well, where's the you know, where's a lobby group for menthol smokers in Britain? It doesn't exist. Of course it doesn't exist. Go on. But I, do, I, I don't think that is just for smokers. I think that's a very British thing. The British are famously very placid. I mean, look at the French now. They, they're rioting in the streets with a, with a Vogue hanging well, out true. within that. <laughs> <laughs> Lighting it on the effigy the, of Macron that has gone up in the streets because of, because of the rioting, you know? Right. I, I think it's, a, it's an inherently British thing to not make a fuss. And I think you're right. I think that more people should make a fuss. 
But I don't think that that is just smokers that don't make it fast. I think it's just the British mentality of like, oh, we'll, we'll just get on with it. For example, I, I'm a menthol smoker. I always have been. Um, they found menthol. I didn't really. I, I moaned about it to my friends in the pub, and then I bought menthol pouches that I now pour into my cigarettes. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and that, that's as much as I did, you know. It's, it's, it's an issue with the whole uh, system, not just... Mm. But also the British people, if you look at them, the British people are just very authoritarian. You know, then yeah. This is not a libertarian country. You, know, you poll, pe poll <laughs> people on anything. My favourite ever bit of polling was a bit of YouGov polling from the 2011 riots, where YouGov was like, let's ask the, the doughty English yeomanry how they would respond to this very mild bit of civil disobedience. And <laughs> one third of them said they wanted live ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the only composition that didn't get 50% plus of the votes. The army, <laughs> riot, police, cavalry. So like, you've got to deal with the British people as they are. And I think the slightly more serious, the slightly more serious serious point is that one mistake that we always make is that we, we couch this thing in sort of very dry terms as being about rights. And if you're not dealing with people who are sympathetic libertarians, that's, that doesn't really engage. And I get this when I go and talk to, you know, for example, gambling companies and so on. And they'll be like, oh, why do we keep losing the PR battles? And I'm like, well, what do you do when you want to go out and do public affairs? They're like, oh, well, we won't put our actual brands on any of the things we want to. We'll use the completely anonymous corporate name. Well, you're acting like you're guilty. Right? Yeah. We actually, you can't, you can't really sell rights because people, you need to sell smoking. You need to go out there and say smoking is great. <laughs> like, you know, it's the cherry it's on top. A, a, a cigarette is the, you know, the cherry on top of a good day, the silver lining on a bad one. Goes with coffee <laughs> and alcohol. Uh, it's perfect. And you, if you need to actually get them to like the thing that you're defending because they're not going to, with the best will in the world, whether it's food, alcohol, uh, cigarettes, you name it, no one's going to go and die on a hill for your right to do something. Their the right to actually enjoy something is a different question. Okay. Well, you actually wrote an article recently for Conservative Home. Um, it was about Wes Streeting's suggestion that Labour might ban the sale um, of cigarettes when they come into power. Now, what did you make of that? And actually, is there any difference really between Labour and the Tories on this? I mean, not really. And, and that's because the Tories don't repeal anything. This is one of, I think, the big of intellectual problems with the Conservative Party is that they spend a lot of, lot of time complaining about something. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, it's part of the solemn duty of conservatism to defend whatever it is this thing is. Um, and then 10 years after that, you've got people on the Tory left saying that actually that's why they're a Conservative. <laughs> <laughs> so, so and, and, you know, you know, they repealed that. They kind of broke the seal. And then David Cameron was talking at some point about repealing. The, but currently, we just have this dynamic where we do nothing. And then Labour go and do something and then we, we accept it. And that's, and that's why we keep losing, because it's intellectually indefensible. It's very hard to, to, to sustain the yeah. position of the laws we happen to have right now are exactly the ones we need. But isn't um, that a problem with conservatism yeah, in itself? Yeah, yes, as a, yes, as a whole, yes, right? yes, it is. Conservatism is, it, is, a, is an ideology I in think itself. With the, with the vaping ban, the problem with it is that there's a very real chance that we'll end up, we'll end up with a Labour government after the next election, but it won't have a lot of money to spend. Now, ultimately, like Labour, like you know, all governments like spending money, but like, most of Labour stuff like spending money. And if it can't spend money, you're going to get this kind of abysmal horseshoe of stuff that doesn't really cost money, which is like Gordon Brown-style constitutional nonsense at one end, and Wes Streeting banning vapes at the other, <laughs> because banning stuff is free. So really, yeah, it's, it's it's not a good policy. The Conservatives will not repeal it if it comes in, but w will it happen? I suspect it might. Okay. Now, Chris, you're the uh, editor of the Nanny State Index, which obviously takes into account Nanny State politics right across Europe. Um, but when it comes to individual freedom and the Nanny State, I mean, is there any, any reason why anybody should vote Tory at the next election? <laughs> no. Um, you threw me with the start of the question. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Nothing to do with the Nanny State Index, does it? Uh, Europe, um, uh, well, we are politically neutral here at the IA, and I don't have a huge view. Is I broadly <laughs> agree with with Henry <laughs> in that they're all in the same game, uh, and without any significant opposition, they, yeah, the, the pressure pressure groups will get their way. You know, the pressure groups descend on any public health minister in particular, uh, surround them, give them all the propaganda, and Public health ministers, and the reason I say in particular is public health ministers tend to be quite junior people who don't actually have a lot of power, but are looking for something to make their name. We saw this with Jane Ellison and numerous, numerous individuals in the past. They all go native if they have any decent instincts to begin with. And so if you come up to them and, and, and say, let's ban alcohol advertising, for example, they'll just do it. You know, the, the, the Scotland is a prime example of this, where you have people who don't have a lot of power, but want to do something. 
and they brought in minimum pricing and they banned buy one get one freeze on pizzas and alcohol and so on and now they're looking at banning alcohol advertising and having a display ban for alcohol uh, alcohol products um it, it's a weakness in really in a way that henry said it's a weakness in the political system insofar as these things are seen as being low cost and the people that they punish are either a small minority or they are perceived as just being a business. It's just an industry. And why would we care what the tobacco industry, the alcohol industry, the fast food industry thing? And in that way, you see liberty gradually being chipped away. Like I said before, it's incremental, very, very gradual. And the raising of the smoking age is almost the perfect example of this because it's incremental. It doesn't actually affect anyone who's already smoking. It just will gradually go up and up and up until in practice you get to a point where people start saying, well, it's a bit mad that 26 year olds can smoke, but 25 year olds can't. The whole thing's ludicrous. And everyone goes, yeah, it's a bit daft, isn't it? Let's ban everyone from smoking. <laughs> That's how it's going to work out. Yeah. That's how prohibition of tobacco will come about in New Zealand and this country and numerous other countries with this classic bait and switch that they always use. Okay. Um, now, this is going to be a slight sort of change of direction because I want to go back to another article that Cara has written, which actually is in the Spectator this week. Uh, it's in the new edition. Um, now, to set the scene, um, <laughs> we hear a lot about uh, health disparities and levelling up, and the anti-smoking lobby is currently arguing that improving people's health in poorer communities is an important part of that process, which is why they would argue uh, the government must intervene and help people in poorer areas to quit smoking. Now, I read uh, Cara's article this afternoon. Um, it's the, the headline. Oh, it was you. <laughs> yeah, lots of, well, the headline is The Killer Next Door, Growing Up in the Murder Capital of Wales. So uh, I told you it's slightly darker than uh, uh, the o an ode to smoking. But there were two quotes that uh, leapt out to me in terms of uh, talking about health disparities and poor communities. Um, Cara wrote, lots of people in Wales suffer poor mental health and murder may be the most extreme symptom, but poor mental health is the disease. So I want to ask Cara first, but maybe the panel generally, is government getting its priorities wrong? Uh, in other words, instead of targeting smoking, uh, which can be a comfort uh, to those with mental health issues uh, or living in poverty, would it not be better if government tackled poor living conditions and the causes of mental health rather than trying to stub out smoking, which, whether we like it or not, a lot of people do smoke for comfort and do smoke to help with their mental health. And of course, a lot of people smoke, as can I say, they live for pleasure. And sadly, on radio and TV these days, you're not really allowed to mention uh, the words pleasure and smoking together. Um, but it is important to emphasise that a lot of people do get a great deal of pleasure from smoking. They know they're health risks, but in some, in some cases, the actual risks are actually part of the pleasure because they enjoy taking that risk. And we did some research, we commissioned research a few years ago of uh, what we call confirmed smokers, 600 confirmed smokers. And 95% they said that they smoked for pleasure. And even those who accepted they were addicted said, well, actually, we don't care if we're addicted because we like it. So basically, what I, I want to come back to this thing. Is government getting its priorities all wrong? Is this really a middle class war yeah. of good do-gooders who are trying to stamp out smoking in poor areas? The, the the anti-smoking lobby is just, it's so inherently classist because when I was growing up, I grew up in the poorest area of the poorest nation. Um, a lot of people uh, were villainized for spending the last 20 pound of their, um, of their salary, which they worked their asses off for, I, I might add, uh, in the pub or buying a pack of fags and uh, they were absolutely villainized oh these people should be feeding their kids these people should be whatever 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 everybody finds a way to try and villainize these people i mean when you grow up very poor in a very poor place that i did having a cigarette is one of the only pleasures that you have i mean how miserable to say to somebody oh you can't do that you shouldn't be doing that it's, it's terrible i mean uh, my favourite example of this, on like a wider scale, is, is Love Island. 
<laughs> don't know if any of you watch it. Um, it's a terrible program. Why would you watch it? <laughs> it's, my, it's my favourite thing. But so Love, I Love Island when it started, right? Love Island was great. It would have working class people on the screens, which you would relate to, uh, growing up in in different areas in the country, um, in level up areas. Uh, and, and, and they would go on TV and they would smoke fags and they would drink cheap Chardonnay and they would get into fights. And, uh, and, and then the anti-smoking lobby got involved. And now on Love Island, nobody's allowed to smoke, nobody's allowed to drink. And it is miserable, boring TV. Um, I think So basically, the reason why Love Island bans smoking is because uh, in one of the seasons, it, I can't remember what season it was, but Lucky Strike was mentioned every five minutes. <laughs> and, and that was terrible. That was absolutely terrible. So they had to get rid of it. So then the smoking areas went, and with it went the entertainment. Because uh, it, it, it's incredibly patronising to say that they don't want working class people causing causing shit on TV. Sorry, I'll say it. But they do. Uh, in, where I grew up, you would have fights outside of pubs. You would have a nice night out. You would have go for a drink on the weekend. Because that's basically the only pleasure you had in the arse end of the South Wales Valleys. You know, <laughs> it, it, that, that, was, that was what we did for fun, and that's fine. That is representational of 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 these people and it, it's patronising to say that these people shouldn't be put on TV or these things shouldn't happen on TV. Yeah. Okay. Henry, I mean, uh, the Tories obviously did, did well uh, in red wall seats. Um, now, it seems to me that these are the seats that are being targeted or were being targeted for levelling up. I mean, that whole campaign seems to have you know, died a death, doesn't it? But. Um, Surely the Conservatives should be distinguishing their policies with those of Labour by saying, actually, we are not going to crack down on things that you enjoy doing, whether it's smoking or, or drinking. But nobody is. I mean, we know they won't. They won't. And the really weird thing is that actually the Conservatives were much better at defending the, the pleasures of working people before working people had the vote. Um, <laughs> or at least when most of them didn't. If, you, if, any, if anyone's ever read George Dangerfield's The Strange Death of Liberal England, there's this fascinating little section in it where he's like, why do working class people, why all of their pubs fortresses of the conservative interest? And it's because basically the Liberals, because the, the temperance instinct is, is undying, the Liberals had a strong movement that wanted to ban alcohol. I don't think it had occurred to them to ban tobacco at the time because everyone thought it was healthy, but you know, they wanted, they to, wanted, to, they wanted to ban alcohol. The Tories were like, nah, we're going we're gonna to defend the working man's right to drink strong horses and therefore the, a lot of working class people clung, clung to the conservative interest. And we've kind of lost that instinct now. And I think it would actually be really interesting because essentially the temperance movement in this country sort of evaporated the moment everyone could vote. And I'd be really interested to see if there was some kind of correlation between the decline of working class participation in, in, in Parliament and public life and the re-emergence of it. But I think ultimately in terms of has the government got its priorities right, the problem with this is that a lot of the benefits of vices, if we're going to call them that, they're all qualitative and essentially impossible to measure. Alcohol is a really obvious example because that's the one that's currently getting debated about being cracked down on. The costs of alcohol to the state, they're numbers, right? They are, they are numbers of people in hospital, they are numbers of cases, they are amounts of money spent. Whereas the benefits of alcohol to the individual, you know, you, you can't go to the government's accountant and be like, well, I asked out someone I wouldn't otherwise have done. <laughs> or I, you know, I met new people, uh, I was a sparkling conversation, whatever it was that you did. That, you, you, that alcohol would other, you, allows you to do. Those, you can't present them and they don't appear in the statistics, so it's very hard to measure them. And the state has no interest in measuring them because ultimately it doesn't, you know, the state doesn't benefit from you being happy, right? <laughs> the state benefits from you being productive, um, which is not, often not the same thing at all. So it, it, it simply, it, it's baked into the very way that states work, that they don't have a reason or a means to properly take into account of human happiness and the pleasure that we get from various things. And so it's inevitable that state policy, unless you are blessed with a particularly stringently libertarian government, is going to end up going in this direction. Okay. Um, now just going back to the, the Khan review, because of course one of the things he, he didn't uh, include uh, was legalising snus. Now in a minute, Reem is going to <laughs> demonstrate um, how you uh, use this this product. But well, this isn't snus. This is, these are nicotine pouches okay. because snus is illegal. In the you can still use it. No, you can't buy you, it. You can, you can bring it over it. from Sweden. So since we since we joined uh, the European Union so, and since 1992, uh, it's been illegal across the European Union, except for in Sweden because they obviously had those special exemptions. And um, snus, so yeah, snus itself is illegal. It's also a tobacco product, whereas nicotine pouches, which I'll show you guys 
here is a um, sort of white, sort of they've got a food grade um, product and it has nicotine inside. So you no just. Tobacco. No tobacco. No just tobacco. Cellulose and nicotine. Cellulose and nicotine. And it is. We should be on QVC to go. <laughs> <laughs> and I always say I look a bit. I always say I look a bit like um, like Elvin from Elvin and the Chipmunks. When I put it in, but here you go. Ta-da! And then the nicotine comes in. <laughs> Chris, uh, explain a bit more about snus because uh, I mean that is something goes has been very successful in Sweden. Mm. It's part of the Swedish culture. When mm. Sweden joined the EU back in 1996, they got an exemption <coughs> because snus was the sale of snus was banned throughout the EU, including the UK. Um, uh, and another thing, of course, it, it could have been a, a Brexit bonus. Having got out of uh, the EU, uh, the UK could have uh, legalised. Uh, snus, but explain the how successful snus has been. Well, when government talks about going smoke free by 2030, which is its arbitrary aim, just announced by Theresa May, it wasn't even in the last Tory manifesto, but apparently it is the 11th commandment now that we must go smoke free by 2030. What they actually mean is not smoke free, they mean fewer than 5% of the population smoking. Sweden is the only country in the developed world, probably the entire world, to actually achieve this. And they didn't set some target for it. They just allowed snus. Snus has been very popular in Scandinavia for literally centuries. And um, when the health hazards of smoking were well known, became well known, there was this enormous migration away from cigarettes towards snus. And, um, and now it's 5% or less of the Swedish population smoke, but a huge number of them use snus. The actual poundage, you know, the, the, the tons of tobacco consumed in Sweden, I, I believe, are still actually very similar to the rest of the world. It's just that they don't smoke it. They stick it under the top lip. And of course, so, so some of the benefits of these is that obviously there isn't this secondhand smoking, right? You can be in conversation with somebody or you can be inside a pub now and, 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 and still have that nicotine use. Whereas um, obviously with smoking, there is that secondhand risk. It's not uh, the same, though. Well, it's not the same. You know, James Dean or That whoever. is true. But, so, it, but to it's, me, it's a choice. To me, it's a positive externality. I was very pleased the other night, coming back late from London, that a couple of girls, well, young women, I suppose, got on the train and lit up cigarettes. On the train. The fact that nightclubs now smell of the people in them, um, yeah. rather than yeah. rather than yeah. tobacco smoke, yeah. is, is yeah. one of the. I know that I know that we're the smoking the smoking area thing is real, but it is very it's very I much. The, I, I would I trade it all. Sat on the train, you know, confirmed non-smoker as I am, Simon, and just go. Ah, oh, smells nice. <laughs> smells like the, when trains used to be trains. <laughs> people you, forget about the positive externalities. Do of, you think that people in my generation, or sort of young younger people, aren't used They're to? They were your generation. Well, okay. They're exactly your generation. Do you, these do you think people are generally just not used to smoking anymore? People go into a pub and they don't. They're not used to. Yeah, smoking but they'd smoking. love it if they. Well, well, I, 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 I mean, one of my <laughs> first memories is growing up, and me and my mother used to go to a, a, a cafe for. Um, breakfast every Saturday and the waitress used to come over and hand me my full English with a Marlboro in her hand and it used to like stink but it was the best memories that I've ever had. <laughs> I, unfortunately my current my current flat share uh, they're not all confirmed smokers so I have to smoke outside like a barbarian but um, <laughs> in my previous arrangement um, we, we were both smokers and so we smoked in the flat and so we'd have parties and we'd be like there is going to be smoking because obviously um, and you'd have people who, who maybe didn't even remember pubs before the ban, and they've got this kind of idea of this pea soup smog yeah. of instant cancer. Um, and they're all, they're all very, very worried about it. And the moment they arrive, they're like, oh, is this it? And it's like, yeah, it's yeah. not hotboxing. Right? Well, it's funny you mention that because we had a, an event at the LC Height Society a couple of weeks ago, and I was making that very point that the younger generation have been sort of fed this myth that every pub was a fug of smoke. And of course there were some pubs like that, particularly if you go back to the 60s or 70s. But in the last sort of, before the smoking ban, a lot of pubs spent a lot of money on decent air filtration systems and everything. And I'm a non-smoker. And in the sort of 30 years that I was going regularly to pubs, I can only remember one time when I walked into a pub in the East End of London, where literally, you know, you were gagging. Uh, but that was in 30 years. And I could go into 
every other pub, and it really wasn't an issue. In Berlin, um, right? Berlin. Now, if you want to, if people are, if, if there's ever been, you go into a bar, and you know, I, 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 I smoke quite lightly usually, and I went with non-smoking friends, and you can be there, and there'll be someone with a cigarette at the next table, and the ventilation mm. system is so good that you probably won't notice. You might occasionally like catch a smell of it, but you're not going to come out with your clothes. Or if stinking. you go to like I'm Arab, shisha is sort of a part of a huge part of our culture, mm. and you go into these sort of shisha bars in 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 the UK, and they have those sort of filtration systems. So, and you know, we, we've, sure we, illegal, but respect well, respect. <laughs> us, listen, us Arabs have been using shisha for generations, and we're all seem to be fine. So yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, and it's a cultural thing as well, yeah. and it was all stubbed down overnight. Yeah, um, stubbed down. Right. That was good. Sorry. Um, it wasn't it's an attack on our culture, that's what it is. Now, I'm afraid we do have to move on and talk about vaping. Uh, how can we not talk about vaping? So enthusiastic. Um, but obviously it's part of the, the Khan review, because to be fair to the Khan review, that's the one thing perhaps that's positive. He essentially endorsed vaping. I mean, all the other anti-smoking stuff was outrageous. But, you know, if we create a society which gives people choice, there's, there's no issue with that. Um, now, Cara, I've noticed, although you're a smoker, a proud smoker, you do have a vape. So I do you vape? smoke in here. <laughs> is that why? Is that, is that the only reason you use it? Well, yeah, this, this is the, uh, this ties me over until I... <laughs> <laughs> until you get the real thing. Exactly. Okay. Um, now, Reem, you switched to vaping. Uh, I mean, can you, for the, our audience here, can you make the case? Uh, because you're now a bit of an anti-smoker, I'm afraid. I'm not an so... anti-smoker, Simon. I, I, I believe in choice, and I believe that people should be able to make their own individual choices. And of course, I mean, there was that landmark review from Public Health England in 2015 that said that smoking is predicted to be um, probably more than 95% less harmful than smoking. And that, I think, is a is a huge win. And sort of the technological advancements, it's essentially basically advancements in the way that they use the batteries. Essentially, it means that we're able to have this technology that is significantly healthier. So if you want to be like 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 car and you want to smoke i think that's completely up to you as your choice but also when i was 19 i decided to quit and the fact that vaping was there as an available uh, tool to quit i think is incredibly effective and i think is a, is a beacon of a free society now you look across the world to countries like australia where they've completely banned the thing and i think that is i mean entirely just sort of absurd because again smoking is still legal <laughs> but vaping the healthier option isn't which i think is totally absurd let people choose but I do think I would say um, I'm not a particularly heavy smoker with cigarettes. Maybe well, it, it theories data I couldn't even give you a figure. But I think with with these, they're so. I don't know. I wake up in the morning and sometimes I vape in bed. I mean, that's the most disgusting thing on earth. And I would never wake up in the morning and, and want a cigarette straight away. I would have like a coffee, go about my day a little bit first. But I think that this so you can just grab it, do it in bed. Um, I mean, the numbers show that a lot of, a lot younger people do it. I mean, my, my niece is like 14 and wants a vape. I, I do think that there is some kind of... Well, I wanted to come on to that, actually, because we are told that there's a vaping epidemic. Now, I know you hate the word, uh, use the word epidemic in the, the, that context because it's completely uh, irrelevant. But we're told there is a vaping epidemic in UK school, uh, schools. Um, do you agree that there is a problem because mm. it seems to have, uh, you know, crept up, but is now escalating quite quickly? Yeah. So do you think it's a problem that does need to be addressed? And how should the government address I it? I think there's been a, a problem on the horizon for a couple of years, and I keep warning people about this. Be and it's only because I have uh, teenage nephews, actually, who every time I go back home to Yorkshire, go like, everyone's vaping, everyone's vaping, Uncle Chris. And <laughs> <laughs> did he really say that? <laughs> well, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, voices have dropped. Them, yeah. And um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and they're all vaping, and they say that you know the currency of school really is is, is selling vapes, and they can all get hold of elf bars and geek bars in particular. And uh, you know my little. Uh, nephews going, you know, you've got to admit, Uncle Chris, they, 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 do appeal, they do appeal to children, don't they? Bright colours. Um, to be fair, is it, they are quite cute, aren't they? They're Pink very, well, look at this. That's like a I baby mean, come dummy, on. isn't it? For goodness this sake. Is, it's a stealth fake. This is the one for... It, don't say that, because right. then they're going to try and burn these now as well. Well, they are trying to burn them. This is the point, Room. You see, they are, because this is now getting through to the mainstream media, as I say. Um, there was an incredible... A series of stories a couple of months ago 
in which kids were having riots at schools because the toilets were being locked. If you looked into the regional press, you could see a, like a string of these stories. Now, to be fair, there was a craze on TikTok of kids just having riots just for the hell of it, right? Because TikTok is, is toxic and that's the kind of thing hey, it does. Hey, don't talk badly about TikTok. Also monitored by the Chinese government. Um, but they, these kids actually had just cause for their riots because the, the teachers literally were locking the toilets all day long, right? You couldn't go out during class and you couldn't go during break time. So when are you supposed to go? Well, you can't. Why couldn't they go? This is the thing that the, the, the articles all seem to miss. The, the reason they were locking the toilets was because all the kids were going vaping in them. So I'm not under uh, underplaying or downplaying at all the amount of vaping that's going on in schools. It, there is definitely, at this moment in time, a huge fad for vaping, specifically elf bars, amongst teenagers. There's just no two ways about it. You can't, you can't get around it. It's happening. I don't know what the proportion of kids vaping is. From like anecdotal evidence, I would say it's not far off 50%. But you wouldn't ban disposable vapes, would you? I wouldn't ban them, but I would like to see trading standards enforce the law. No, because right? I, I, I So totally they're, they're being sold at higher than the legal nicotine limit. I don't think there should be a nicotine limit myself. But that's beside the point. They're getting a competitive advantage over the other products. Uh, and they're being sold to kids all the time, right? So my, my little nephew, I don't know, we're putting them in the, in the, in the mud here. I know this is being filmed. But, <laughs> like, teenagers in general find it... I, I was asking them, I said, like, well, how, how do you get hold of these, these, these products? You know, you have to be 18 to buy them. So it was easy. You just either buy them through your mum's Amazon account and pick them up, or you just you go on... You go in the shop, just go in the shop. I don't think people who run, like, convenience stores, corner shops take the sale of e-cigarettes as seriously as they do Smirnoff or Marlboro. And I think trading standards need to get on the case here because if they start dishing out a few £20,000 fines to people selling elf bars to kids, you'd soon see this craze you know, die away. Okay. Now, look, I would like to go to the audience now to try and uh, get some questions in from the audience. Um, I am going to come back to the panel at the end. And the question I'm going to ask each member of the panel when I come back to you um, if you were health secretary, what would you include in your tobacco control plan, or would you even have a tobacco control plan? So, oh God. Think, think of your answer. You've got about ten minutes to think of your okay. answer. In the meantime, let's go and have some questions. Right, we're going to start, uh, Martin, at the back, the far corner, and then we'll come to this gentleman in the other corner. Um, that was all really good, thank you. Um, could you say something about your thoughts on the connection between... Uh, Sort of anti-smoking prohibition and woke um, both seem to have high uh, degrees of purity uh, connections but uh, I really think it's worth exploring that because that arguably seems to have more of a resonance than talking about nanny states and health fascists. Thank you. Okay does anybody want to take that? Well they're, they're both inherently intolerant are they you know and um, they they they're authoritarian in effect i mean I, woke is a very broad term but i mean if you're talking about kind of remaking society along some kind of utopian ideal which is how i would interpret it then the idea that everybody is incredibly healthy and doesn't take any risks seems to be in line with that uh, and I don't know, I'm, I'm way too young really to know, you know what the, the blue-eyed woke people believe or whether maybe, maybe smoking is coming back amongst those communities, in which case I'm actually, despite what I said earlier, totally in favour of it. But I don't think it is. I think that, you know, there's a puritanical aspect, isn't there, to the whole thing. I mean, Andrew Dorr wrote a book about the woke people. It was titled The New Puritans. And uh, puritanism is a very good way of looking at that movement because it was very iconoclastic, about you know, smashing down statues, destroying history, but also Puritan in the, the usually accepted sense is you know, no drinking, no taking drugs, no, no having fun, no dancing, whatever. Um, it's very much say, uh, you know, part, part of the same parcel, but at the same time, of course, it precedes the woke movement by, by decades. There have always been Puritans of all sorts of different shades and stripes and the modern identity politics puritan is one of those kind of strands 
Um, but uh, yeah, they let's say they fit together very nicely, but I don't think either is dependent on the other. Good. Uh, gentleman at the back, and then we'll come to the gentleman here. Great. Uh, hi, really great discussion. Um, one of my pet projects at the moment is researching the link between smoking bans and political movements. And I've told the Chris enough about this before, but the ONS are fed up with my SRS request, so I'll ask the panel. Did the smoking ban in pubs cause Brexit? Who wants to answer that? Henry, that's yours, surely. Go on, go for it. I don't know what that says about me. Um, <laughs> do I think it caused, caused, caused Brexit? No, but it will have contributed to the sense of alienation that bits of the country that voted leave yeah. felt. Like, you know, I went to the University of Manchester and some of my friends are still involved with Manchester Council. And there are bits of Manchester where, even when I was there at university and wherever, um, <laughs> there were 13 or 14 pubs in this one ward. And there's now two. And if you talk to the councillor on the record, they will say things like changing trends, supermarket competition, and all the rest of it. But if you talk to them off the record, what they'll say is, yeah, that's a smoking ban. <laughs> Basically, everyone, you know, these, these people all want to smoke, so they drink at home now. And really, the smoking ban, and other and, and you know, the IEA did a very good thing on this about the impact, the disproportionate impact of syntaxes on the less well off. It's basically symptomatic of an entire approach to policy, which does not take the, the pressures and the pleasures of, of many of those people into account. Now, is it, you can't, I think, get from there to it caused Brexit, um, but it definitely didn't help that the Remain Westminster group, the establishment, if you want to call them that, I don't really use the word, but were so alienated and so uncaring about those people and, and their lives, yeah. Yeah, I don't think one led to the other, but I do think there were similarities. For example, uh, we often heard uh, throughout um, the Brexit debate that people who voted for Brexit uh, were stupid. They didn't know what they were voting for. And there was this other class of people who knew better than them. And it's exactly the same with smoking. Uh, we're told that smokers are actually that they're stupid. And they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand the health risks, but we know better. And that's why we've got to get them off smoking. And so I do think there are similarities. And it points to a, a, a bigger picture where you do have this, uh, this elite who are telling the rest of the population what to do. And I'm not sh quite sure what we do about it. No, um, but no. Actually, oh, sorry, I was just saying, I, should, I realised, because it's a problem with drinking wine on the panel, I forgot to point out, it, it, the anti-smoking policies did cause my Brexit vote. Um, <laughs> because while I can dress it up and intellectualise it, and you know, normally for professional reasons I do, I've just realised this is being filmed, um, <laughs> the, the actual reason that I voted leave is because they banned my cigarettes and I was furious, um, if I get right down to it. No, but I, I, th I think that I think the, the two things are married. It, Pontypridd is a big smoking town, and secondly it was a very big Brexit town. And I think the ironic thing about what you just said is that smokers are the backbone of society. They, the, the plumbers, the, 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 they lay bricks, they're the squaddies, you know, they, they, they are the, the, the working people. Um, and to patronise and to say, oh, they, they don't know what they're doing. I mean, let's see a world without smoking and let's see a world without smokers. I'd love to see it. Also, one, one final point, if I may, just quickly. There was also a really classist thing about the, yeah. the smoking. It's, it's a bit inherently like, classist. Because well, this happens a lot, right? Because one of the other things I used to write about is firearms policy. And, you know, you can still own a rifle or a shotgun, which are the posh people guns, but it was the working class yeah. handgun owners mm -hmm. who, who, who made, made completely illegal. With the smoking ban, you can smoke a pipe indoors if you go to one of the very nice shops on St. James's. Yeah. And you can smoke a cigar indoors, because it wouldn't be reasonable to expect the kind of Not people who smoke cigars to go outside and smoke cigars. <laughs> yeah. But even in those areas where the air is full of tobacco smoke, you can't smoke cigarettes in there. So no, the, the policy is very, the policy, the anti-smoking policy in general is very clearly classist. Mm. And that's a, that's a clear contributing factor. Well, absolutely. I mean, it's the, the pub um, that was uh, harmed most by the smoking ban was the, the urban landlocked pub, the, the pub that didn't have a beer garden where you get all these lovely middle-class gastro pubs with their big beer gardens. And of course they've been fine uh, because they don't have a problem. They still have somewhere where people can smoke. But I say, I mean, of the thousands of pubs, I think 11,000 pubs closed um, after the smoking ban, uh, the, and 10 years after the smoking ban. It wasn't all to do with the smoking ban, and clearly there were other issues uh, there as well. But it certainly pushed thousands of pubs over the edge, pubs that were already struggling. 
Uh, this gentleman here in the, the middle. Thank you. Um, having written an article for us for this Becky a couple of years ago, suggesting that more of um, Britain's pubs should die because they're simply too terrible. Um, I must, I must, I must slightly demur on, on that point, but uh, uh, nonetheless. Um, a simple question, basically. Um, which does the panel think is more likely to happen sooner, if I'm phrasing that the right way? Um, the complete prohibition of uh, cigarettes um, or the legali legalization of uh, marijuana smoking? Mm. It's a good question. A very good question. What can they tax more? I, th I would think, yeah, for that reason, marijuana. That can cannabis be legalized before tobacco is prohibited. But tobacco will be... Uh, so heavily restricted by that point that the difference between prohibition and legalization will be fairly trivial. You look at somewhere like Canada, um, I mean, uh, it's hard to think of any countries that are more off the scale when it comes to tobacco control than Britain, but Canada is pretty far up there. Uh, but they, they legalized cannabis several years ago, no problem at all. Uh, it's, it's an interesting, it is a genuinely interesting question because I, I, I think the, I mean, Henry might have more to say about this, but particularly regarding the, the Conservative Party. But the, the Conservative Party and all the parties really are, are way behind public opinion on cannabis. Um, I think that no government would have much of a problem legalising cannabis actually. And it would, as you say, bring in, by my estimate, about a billion pound a year uh, in, in tax revenue, which is not to be sneezed at. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but yeah, the, the, the fact that, I, which I think you, you pertains pertain to, we, we're going in a more liberal direction around the world on cannabis and going in a much l less liberal direction with, with smoking doesn't make any sense. And people say this, to me, say this to me all the time. Why can, I go to, why can I go to Amsterdam and smoke a spliff, but only if it's pure marijuana? <laughs> if I put tobacco in it, I'm breaking the law. And it's true. That's what the law is there. Exactly. And probably Canada too, and a few other places. It doesn't make any sense unless you see it a little bit like, you know, the guy who mentioned the woke thing. These things are cyclical. It's just a reaction to what's gone before. It's just, you, now you've got the boomers reacting to the, the, the previous generation, going, well, we always kind of believed in, in cannabis legalization. We don't really smoke it ourselves anymore, but it's the kind of thing that liberals believe. 60s liberals believe in cannabis legalization. We didn't care about tobacco because tobacco wasn't an issue in, in the 60s. And so it goes in cycles. Maybe one day it'll go another cycle and they'll be banning cannabis and bringing tobacco back. I don't know. Also, it's worth pointing out, I've got friends in Canada, and it's worth remembering if you, if you, are, if you are a cannabis smoker. Um, from the, again, from the consumer perspective, legalisation has been a bit of a mixed bag in Canada because previously in Vancouver, for example, you had a, you had a thriving sort of head shop scene and it was all sort of cheap and tax free and, and all of that. And once they brought in the legal stuff, the police, because those head shops were now competing with the state monopoly, um, crack down very heavily and now basically as a consumer you only have the you really only have the option of very heavily regulated highly taxed expensive yeah. marijuana whereas five years ago before it was legalized but it wasn't really policed you as a consumer were better off so I think it's I think it's always important when we talk about legalization given that we're at the IEA to think do I really want more of the state involved in my, in my but again, consumption of this particular product? isn't that inherently classist so you have something that is um, able to buy from the streets from the normal people oh no we'll just tax the hell out of it so cigarettes are 20 pound a pack or marijuana is i don't know 50 pound a gram and and then we can make some money from it it's not really class the state doesn't care if you enjoy something no but it, no, but it, but it just it, but it just means that the case. working class person can't afford the, the tiny luxuries that they yeah, have in life sure. yeah, and that the rich can well i mean it, this, this doesn't affect the rich at all this doesn't affect anybody but the person that is scraping together to pay their rent or to to put food on the well if ever, if ever it really took off with the rich they switch from having it as like a percentage of the overall cost to having minimum unit pricing because that's what you do for stuff <laughs> that's what you do for stuff rich people that's like. the effect of yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely if, you, if you've got problems with alcohol by god you're not putting it on the nice wine right like you're just, you're just putting it on the white lightning and all the, and all the rest of it yeah precisely right martin over there yeah, I, I, um, firstly, I want to have a remark what Henry said about, um, you know, the, the number of anti-smoking organisations. I mean, I remember I helped out with the Hands Off Our Packs campaign in 2012, 
And Andrew and Harbour and I of this parish tried to count the amount of anti-smoking organisations in the UK. We got to 250 and gave up because we just couldn't docu document them all. Um, but the point I want to... Why are you funded by the public? All of them, every single one of them. We, I mean, we got to two, yeah, all of them are tax donations, I mean, rather than Oh, no, none of them, no. They, were, <laughs> they all pay by taxes. But that was a remark. But, but I think the point of all of this stuff is the expansion of snobbery in this country and other countries, where I'm old enough to remember where Mary Whitehouse, when she was ridiculed by people like Morecambe and Wise on the TV, and the whole country said, just keep out of our lives. We don't want to hear from you. And yet a lot of this stuff seems to be snobbery, like, like the question about Brexit. It's, it's, the, it's people who in this country now seem to be able to just stamp down on people below them and just say, we, we don't use that thing, but we don't think that person should use it. I think one of the perfect examples of this was, was um, uh, Jamie Oliver cheering when the sugar tax came in. <laughs> Super mega rich Jamie Oliver cheering, literally punching the air that he'd, he'd stop poor people from, from buying Coca-Cola. And, and um, you know, as, as you know, I, I deal with, with uh, harm reduction in America and, and the biggest screams in America have come about, about vaping because all of a sudden it was middle class kids using it. They didn't care about when poor kids were smoking or black kids were smoking. It was when the middle classes saw their kids vaping. That's when the panic happened. And a whole lot of it is just down to snobbery. I'd like to, uh, I'll put it into question. Well, what does the panel think of that? <laughs> what what does the panel think? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I was going to say, I think that generally speaking, um, it, historically, we've all, we've, people have always used nicotine and, and nicotine is <laughs> something that we've used um, uh, historically always. However, I think that this, you know, this, this debate around youth vaping and young people starting to uptake vaping, I think is less of a problem than it really is. And people generally do. And maybe, maybe Martin's right. And, that, and that's why it is, because sort of middle class up, uptaking vapes, it means that there, there's sort of, there is this outrage. But I would rather walk on the street and hear 14 year olds say pass the vape than pass the fag right uh, it, it, it's not it's safer it's healthier <laughs> i'd rather than be doing that <laughs> well, that's the exact point i mean I, I may i may have given the impression that there is a <laughs> yeah. I'm, i may have given the impression there is a teen vaping epidemic in this country and yeah if you get rid of the word epidemic yes there has been there is i mean like i say for a couple of years it's been obvious to me a huge number of school kids are vaping and the answer to that i think is clamping down on, on underage sales but also like like room says it is of all the things teenagers could be doing it is the least worrying right they could be smoking they could be drinking they could be having unprotected sex they could be taking drugs they could be doing lots of things and now <laughs> they might <laughs> and they're, apparently they're not <laughs> <laughs> not doing any of this. In a minute, Henry will tell you why they should be doing all this. Stuff. But for now, I'm going to give you the socially respectable answer, which is that at least they're not doing that. They're only vaping. And I spoke to a teacher the other day, I spoke to a deputy head just last weekend, a friend of mine, and I said, Is there, is there a lot of vaping going on in your school? And he goes, To be honest, yeah, there is quite a lot of vaping. He goes, Is there much smoking? He goes, Now you mention it, I don't think I've caught a child smoking for ages. But are they all depressed? <laughs> No, because they're vaping. But I, I, but I, I think obviously you know you can take a view on whether or not they should be doing it at fourteen. But to loop back to the point I made at the beginning, what got those kids rioting was not a worthy appeal in defence of other people's right to vape. It was the fact that they were vapors, right? You need people to have no, skin in the game if you want to. Yeah, if you want to. Because the toilets. Doesn't matter whether you're a vapor or not. You weren't allowed to go. They, use they were. They were affected. So you need. If you, need, you, you need, if you want people to be active in this kind of thing, you need to sell them the actual product. I think the point of the matter is, is that it's not a problem, right? If, if, if young people, I would much rather see young people start to vape than start to smoke. It's not a major it's problem. Let's just say it's not a major This is how they win. It's not yeah, great. Yeah, it's when yeah. half of an IEA yeah. forest panel is yeah. Yeah. At least they're not smoking. Right. That is a very good point. Actually, it's been a bee in my bonnet for several years. But actually, I do think free market think tanks uh, are actually have forgotten that there is a right to smoke and they're so delighted that the free market has discovered this wonderful solution to the problem of smoking as they call it and I'm 100% behind vaping I think it's fantastic that consumers have more choice and it's all about choice 
But when free market think tanks talk, uh, basically embrace the government's 2030 smoke-free England, and they say, oh yes, the way you'll achieve a smoke-free England is by getting everybody over to vaping. No, we shouldn't even be talking about a smoke-free 2030. Right. Once you start setting targets, you actually encourage governments to introduce some pretty draconian policies. So I must include, we've got about five minutes, so I want to get a um, gentleman here, and then we'll take two questions at the back. And gentlemen, there, that's four questions, and we'll answer them all together. Yes, so, sorry, this isn't very funny, but I totally disagree about this fake business. Um, it's not very good. Um, in America, it's taken hold of the younger population. I read statistics in this country, and you can take it with however many grains of salt you wish, that 56% uh, of 11 to 15 year olds in this country have tried vaping. And the reason for that is because they're led to believe that it's less harmful than tobacco. And well, that's what the. It that, is. It well, it matters. is. And, uh, but the point is that uh, even Dr. Khan is now advocating that it should be handed out and youngsters are taking this up. Now, we know that cigarettes have been blocked off in the sweet shops. I, I use the word sweet shop specifically because <laughs> cigarettes are predominantly sold in places where children go. You can't see the cigarettes anymore because they're behind the, the shutters. But the vapes. The, the melons and the strawberries and the ice cream flavours are all in front of them. And, you know, the point is, are we talking about tobacco here or nicotine? Because we know nicotine is a highly addictive substance. And the worst thing we want to do is to encourage young people to become addicts at a very young age. My question to the panel is, isn't it time that tobacco and tobacco-related products, including vapes, shouldn't be sold in sweet shops, but should be sold in chemists where children don't go. Hey, hey. <laughs> no, no, we'll talk about that. But you can answer that question. Right, a couple of guys at the back want to ask a couple of questions. They'll go to chemists if they sell vapes there. Hello, yes, I agreed with much of what the panel said. Um, but it seems like a foregone conclusion, a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about, that eventually we won't be able to do X, Y, and Z. What is the campaign to stop this? And what would you recommend? I mean, you've recommended what the government should do, but what is the boots on the ground going to be able to do to stop this? Okay, thank you. And a couple of guys at the back. Yeah, just picking up on the topic of uh, arguments that may not overall win the smoking argument or whatever. But um, I, I was I was I was thinking about the comparison actually between the whole trans topic and smoking in terms of the decisions that young people are making, which have long-term yes. implications um, on, and, 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 and costs on, on and, and costs on the NHS. If if, if you say uh, uh, you know uh, transitioning is something which is uh, which is a choice that happens, and then there is the ongoing costs that are required for it. There's, there's arguably comparisons to be made there in terms of saying, well, if they can choose that, why can't they choose to smoke, which I think you could quite easily say is going to be cheaper overall. Okay, Chris, you'll be answering that question. I was going to say, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Let's see. Yeah, Sorry, yes. Um, I, should, I want to kind of address very quickly the, the vaping points. I had the great pleasure of editing a book by a called Dr. Professor Bernard Mayer from the University of Graz on vaping. And the statistics are so clear on the healthiness compared to smoking on vaping. 95% plus. And nicotine is a harmless subject, uh, a harmless you know, um, chemical when you compare it, even compared to caffeine, you know, so it's a much better thing. But I did want to quickly follow up the point, actually, um, on following targets. Full, you know, discretion there. I'm director of research at the ASI. I'm involved in a lot of kind of Boo. policy pushing. No, ha, ha. Um, basically, <laughs> I, <laughs> what I want to say is, I, I know there is a greater kind of libertarian yeah. We, as kind of the people who believe in choice and free markets and, um, you know, liberty in the room, we are the people who have to kind of follow the instruction and follow, you know, what COP10 wants to say or follow what the Department for Health wants to say. I wouldn't say entirely that it's a problem that we oppose um, the idea of smoking in terms of tobacco harm reduction, um, but rather we do have to, you know, kind of dance the jig that the government sets in order to win the battles. I mean, would you agree with that? 
Yes. Okay, thank you. Right, let's go to the panel and answer whichever question you want to Can answer. I answer I the, think of any. the first one. Do you want us to do it in order? Or do you, okay. <laughs> well, Remy, you want to answer the, the, the vaping the, yes, question. Yes, the vaping you? question. So, uh, I mean, Maxwell kind of sort of touched on that already in his question, but the argument that uh, nicotine is obviously, you, you see it on, on the sort of plain packaging now that, that nicotine is an addictive substance. It isn't the, the primary cause of health risks, the, uh, tobacco related health risks at all. So, the, you know, the, the fact that we can use uh, nicotine, uh, nicotine rich substances such as uh, snus or, or nicotine pouches or vaping, it is significantly less harmful than smoking. And nicotine itself isn't the, isn't, it could be addictive, but it isn't the harmful substance that are causing all of these. It's, it's the carcinogens in, in tobacco products. It's the numerous amount of chemicals in these tobacco products, in cigarettes, that are causing uh, uh, the, these tobacco related health risks. So I, 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 I understand the sort of, the, the sort of uh, tendency to go crazy when we see young people vaping but actually I think that I would much rather see young people choosing and, and we are seeing them choose a much healthier version uh, of nicotine and I would much, I'd much rather see them do that than, than, than smoking which is of course much more harmful to their health. Okay, uh, Chad of the Bank was basically asking us what can we do essentially to fight back. Now Henry I think you're the best <laughs> Place person to well, I mean, that depends on how you're asking the question, because if you're asking the question of how do we win as libertarians, I don't know, people aren't libertarians, right? I mean, libertar libertarian arguments don't create, distribute state patronage, they don't create, they don't create jobs at think tanks and panels and so on, so you're not really going to, you're not gonna really going to win that way. I think the problem with the argument of we need to dance the jig to win the battles is that we haven't won any battles in a very long time, right? So, um, but if you want to win as a smoker or a drinker or whatever other vice it is, the, the, the crucial answer is learn how to get hold of your stuff on the black market and then introduce other people to your happy hobby, right? Um, <laughs> if you, if, if, you know, I want to be smoking for the rest of my life, however long or short that is, and the only way I'm going to be able to do that is one, if I can get hold of them, and two, if I've got people to do it with, because sharing tobacco is one of life's great joys. So go out and yeah, yeah. go forth, spread the word, um, you know, introduce people, to, introduce people to tobacco. I think the problem with the idea of selling in chemists is that you're, you're making the mistake again of conceding, you're basically picking an unwinnable battle, which is the one which is like, oh, these are evil, but we defend the right to do evil and bad things, because that's a mad proposition for anyone who's not a libertarian. No, these are great. Um, they're lame, but they're great. And so you should, you should, you should never concede anything to anyone on any of these issues, right? I want these, I want these sold, I want people wandering around the trade selling them at cinema, um, as they did in the good old days. So, so no, you, ultimately you have to believe in your product. Right? Yeah, yeah, oh, you yeah. have to believe in what in what in what you're in your hobby. You have to believe that it's right and good. It's not enough to mount a dry, desiccated defense of rights because most people don't care about your rights at the end it's, of the day. It's, it's also more than that. I mean, look at this existentially a bit more. Like this isn't about cigarettes. This isn't about nicotine, vaping, whatever. Who cares? This is about choice. This is about we're on this world for a very short time. Do whatever you want. Do what makes you happy. It's fun. Uh, you know what? Like, yeah, I started smoking at 14. Yeah, maybe I will live a very short but very happy life. <laughs> um, I'm very okay with that. And everybody else that I know that smokes is also very okay with that. It's it's about making decisions for your own body. I mean, we're all grown ups. This is about autonomy. This is about choice. For a, okay, slo well, for a slogan, should it be don't knock it if you haven't tried it? Exactly. Well, I have to, actually, I think. <laughs> Apart from the fact we're all going to slow our words, um, which is becoming quite noticeable. Um, but I think we should end on that note. No, That's no, the no, perfect note. So Did you want to say something more? Yeah. You're, you're slowing your words more than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did I slow? I want, to, I want to respond to this gentleman here because I'm, I'm grateful for his question. I'm grateful that he's asked the question. I'm grateful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful that he's asked the question in a, in a, in a venue where he knows most people are going to disagree with him and everybody on the panel is going to disagree with him. And I, I do actually share your uneasiness about the potential of you know, vast numbers of school children becoming addicted to nicotine. Um, and I mean, this hysteria, well, no, it's not called hysteria. This concern is only going to get greater, and I understand why it's going to get greater. You're going to see more and more children using vapes who've never smoked, and vapes were never designed for people who hadn't smoked. I get that. The thing is, it, w it was always inevitable that once you made smoking extremely unpopular, particularly amongst young people, that the people who were using nicotine were going to use e-cigarettes. Because if you reduce the amount of risk from using nicotine, <coughs> and reducing the, the, the price of using nicotine, as we have done with, with Elf Bars and all the other e-cigarette products, 
then of course they're going to become more <coughs> appealing. This is basic economics. Of course they're going to become more appealing. Unless you believe that children have no latent desire, no latent demand for nicotine whatsoever, and nicotine is just going to magically disappear, always <coughs> you're going to have teenagers are going to start using e-cigarettes. The question is, is it better that they use e-cigarettes <coughs> or start smoking cigarettes? We know that ever since cigarettes have been around, kids have been smoking cigarettes in large quantities and large numbers. Now they're using e-cigarettes in large quantities and in large numbers. There isn't really a third way in, in reality in which they don't use any form of nicotine. Yeah. So although I and most people would probably be uncomfortable with the idea of millions of kids getting on the elf bars and potentially getting addicted to nicotine, I'm afraid that in practice is really the only option. And actually getting off e-cigarettes isn't that difficult. And I hate to use an N equals one study and go back to my own family in Yorkshire again, but my 15 year old cousin's uh, nephew is just given, <laughs> given up e-cigarettes. <laughs> he still drinks like a fish. <laughs> and I'm worried about him from that point of view, but at least he's given up e-cigarettes. Well, we've had uh, more than enough about Chris's family uh, this evening. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna finish there by thanking First of all, I want to thank the staff at the IA, uh, Jack in particular, but we've had great help from the entire team here. So can we thank the staff at the IA? Thank you very much. Thank you to you, the audience, for coming out on a, on a wet night. Give yourselves a round of applause. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast. <laughs>